The British Army. To an outsider, it looks like one single fighting force. In reality, it's divided into more than 40 independent regiments, each with its own culture and traditions. And if you want to understand the British Army, these regiments are the best place to start. In this program, we meet a regiment whose reputation was forged when an isolated band of 122 British soldiers survived an assault by 4,000 Zulu warriors. Things going through their head must have been absolutely incredible, crazy. The heroic last stand won more bravery awards than any other battle in British military history. We are the guys who carry on that legacy today, and especially up here in Afghanistan. Touch. All the this is a regiment where eating leeks is a rite of passage, and goats become lance corporals. All you gotta do is make sure you don't get a gravy potato in the back of the head. It's a regiment whose fighting spirit is deeply rooted in its national identity. The Royal Welsh. Royal Welsh! Royal Welsh! Top! January 2011. Highway 1 near Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. The Royal Welsh are operating in an area under threat from Taliban roadside bombs, known as IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Is there any particular Kandahar. reason you go into Kandahar? Is it bizarre or is it for a family occasion? Yeah. Our main mission is to protect the main highway that runs around Afghanistan itself. It's had a lot of IED problems in the past, and the insurgents coming and laying IEDs, which have blown out both civilians, American soldiers, and our own forces in the last uh, couple of years. If you look to your south on the high ground there, just as the high ground comes down, slopes down, there's another little knoll just to the right of it. That's where we had one large IED explosion which destroyed one of our vehicles. It's a 36-ton vehicle, so a very large explosion. The bias patrolling outside the area of the highway itself, their eyes are on us and on the highway, which protects the highway, and we can help reassure these locals. The Royal Welsh is made up of approximately 1,500 soldiers and 200 officers. It's divided into three infantry battalions, based in Wiltshire, Cheshire and Glamorgan. The first battalion are light infantry. The second are armoured infantry. And the third are made up of territorial army reservists. The roots of the Royal Welsh reach back over 300 years. But its defining moment came in 1879 in one of the most heroic last stands in British military history. On the 11th of January, 1879, the British army invaded a tribal nation in southern Africa, Zululand. 8,000 soldiers crossed the Buffalo River. Most of them marched on. But they left 122 soldiers to set up a supply base near a small mission station whose name has become military legend. Rourke's Drift. The men who stayed behind were from B Company, part of the 24th Regiment of Foot, which would later become the Royal Welsh. Many were inexperienced and in poor physical condition. Colour Sergeant Frank Bourne recorded events in his diary. This was my first experience of active service. I stood only five foot six inches and I was painfully thin. I was only 23, sensitive and afraid of my new responsibilities. The British Army set up its main camp 12 miles away at the base of Isandlawana Mountain. 
On the 22nd of January, 800 soldiers armed with rifles were slaughtered by 20,000 Zulu warriors carrying spears and cowhide shields. Back at the supply base, soldiers like Private Henry Hook continued with their routine duties. Everything was perfectly quiet at Rook's Drift. Not a soul suspected that only a dozen miles away, the very men we had said goodbye and good luck to were on the last throes of life. In the early afternoon, B Company's commander, Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, was informed about the slaughter at Islandawana. He ordered Private Fred Hitch to climb on top of a building and look out for the enemy. I could see the Zulus had got as near to us as they could without us seeing them. I told Bromhead that they were at the other side of the rise and would extend him for attack. I told him that they were numbered up to four to six thousand. A voice from below, is that all? We can manage that lot very well for a few seconds. The 1964 film, Zulu, helped turn the men of B Company into legends. They're on the moon, sir. North Wall, keep those riflemen on the hillside pinned down. Wall. But Zulu's epic portrayal of the battle is not entirely accurate. In the film, 4,000 Zulus attack Rourke's Drift over a vast flat plain. In fact, the mission station was built on a six-foot ridge. And B Company turned it into an improvised fortress with barricades of sandbags and biscuit boxes. The Zulus found it difficult to scale the British defences during their early attacks. The British soldiers also had another advantage. They were armed with one of the most technically advanced weapons in the world. The Martini Henry Rifle. Well guys, welcome to Queen Victoria's weapon of mass destruction. This is a Martini Henry rifle. This was the standard service firearm of the British Army between 1874 and 1889. It's a single shot breech loading weapon capable of pulling a bullet through a railway sleeper at 500 yards. To load it, it was simplicity in itself. It was soldier proof. You simply open the lever which drops the breech. The round is then slid into the breech, bring up the lever and it's now cocked and ready to fire. A good rifleman could expect to get around 14 rounds a minute away with this. So it's a quantum leap in firearm technology. If you've got a man running towards you, this will put a bullet clean through him and maybe through the guy behind him. The kick and the physical effort from this weapon, it, it's quite physically challenging. It's completely different to the rifles that we've got now. I'll, I'll have a kickback on it. <laughs> Loaded after every round, uh, I wouldn't feel very good at all. I'd flap with the loading and unloading all the time, so I'd probably drop it and run like a little baby. <laughs> the secondary weapon to be issued with the Martini Henry was the 1876 pattern bayonet. Triangular shape because you cannot stitch up a triangular wound. If you took that into, into a person's body, the, mainly the only way to get it out is actually kick them off or fire around. The front round will kneel and push the bayonet up into the chest of the adversary or the horse's chest coming towards you. And behind the man that's kneeling is the second rank which is actually firing over his shoulder. The muzzle is very close to his ear. You can understand why most Victorian soldiers was deaf. It must have been an immense physical effort to, to fight the Zulus that day. If they do some, I couldn't do what they done. <laughs> Hats off to him. Every year, on the anniversary of Rourke's Drift, the regiment gathers to watch the film Zulu. Okay, so these guys and in the officers' mess, new recruits are told the events of the battle. To stay. This is your history. Okay, so those guys who stood in your shoes beforehand, this is what happened to them, and this is what they did. If you imagine, on the night, they fired 20,000 rounds of this, to the point where the kick on the rifle was so significant, and they fired so many rounds, that actually dislocated some of their shoulders. Okay, so a nightmare. 
you try putting yourself, I think, in that situation and stood there, obviously all the high ground around you and just imagining everyone around you and it must have been, things going through their head must have been absolutely incredible, crazy. With 40 Zulus for every British soldier, B Company was fighting against all the odds. Just imagine, guys, this is the, the sort of sandbag barrier here with a few of the biscuit boxes scattered around. Just imagine these chaps down here, private soldiers, trying to fend back these Zulus who are coming at them with their spears, fighting hand to hand to save each other. By late afternoon, the Zulus were now breaking through the sandbag barricades. Most of B Company retreated behind a hastily erected wall of biscuit boxes around the storehouse. But six soldiers, including Private Hook, together with a dozen sick and injured, were trapped inside the hospital building. We were pinned like rats in a hole. Already the Zulus were fiercely fighting, trying to burst through the doorway. The only way of escape was the wall itself, by making a hole big enough for a man to crawl through. Private Hook and the other healthy soldiers managed to rescue nearly all the sick and injured men. But the supply base was now overwhelmed by Zulus. The British soldiers stood little chance of escape. To honor their forebears, this company, now fighting in Afghanistan, is called B. Rourke's Drift Company. The comparisons, I think, are, are quite strong. We're living in very basic conditions here, as the men did back then. And we've got an enemy force around us, which uh, does intend to do us great harm. I think that sense of isolation is, uh, is quite strong these days, and that what binds us all together, the sense that we are living in a, in a, uh, in a base which is uh, no bigger, I'm sure, than what they defended back in 1879. This is our eating area, you can see some of the foods, obviously, we've got in this location. The last obviously six months since we've been living off army rations. The tendency we do get some fresh, like eggs, and uh, when obviously you've got control, we do get a couple of fresh meals like bread, cheese slices, and all the sauces and compliments actually go with it. It's our library, a couple, couple of few, few books, and the only obviously bit of, bit of fun we have in the night, so obviously playing darts. We've only two darts which we got, the other one got damaged. This is our homemade gym, which we made up ourselves to obviously keep us fighting fit before we go home. This is where our toilet is. Slightly hidden away so we can put a privacy. Obviously, uh, obviously pulling in bags at the moment. And obviously all the black bags are burnt. The rooms themselves, 18 man tents. Obviously we've only got about 13 guys living there at the moment. As you can see, obviously the rooms, very basic. All the luxuries obviously sent in by family members who are bought from the PX. Like protein shakes, a number of the guys are on protein shakes. As you see, we live very basically, but the guys are comfortable. I think that's everything a soldier needs these days. In the early hours of the 23rd of January, B Company made their last stand from behind a biscuit box barricade. Private Hitch was expecting the worst. Deacon, a comrade, said to me as I was leaning back against the biscuit boxes, Fred, when it comes to the last, shall I shoot you? I replied, no. They have nearly done for me, and they can finish me right out when it comes to the last. The men of B Company resisted wave after wave of attack. In the film, the end of the fighting is marked with a show of respect from the Zulu warriors. They're saluting you. <laughs> They're saluting fellow braves. <laughs> but according to contemporary accounts of the battle, this Zulu salute to B Company is fiction. In reality, it was the arrival of British Army reinforcements that brought about the Zulu retreat. We saw the Zulus had once more swept round the mountain to attack us 
but it was too late. And on seeing that we were reinforced, they turned silently away, and only their dead and a few wounded were left with us. Seventeen men died at Rourke's Drift. Nine were injured, and around 450 Zulus were killed. Seven Victoria Crosses were awarded to the 24th Regiment of Foot. At Rourke's Drift, more bravery awards were given to a regiment than any other battle in British military history. British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli described its defence as one of the proudest moments of the British Empire. Every year, on the Sunday before Rourke's Drift Day, the Royal Welsh hold a remembrance service at Brecon Cathedral to honour those who fought at Islandawana and Rourke's Drift. After veterans parade into the cathedral with the standards of the Royal Welsh Ancestral Regiments, the Colonel of the Regiment, Major General Roddy Porter, celebrates the regimental spirit of the Royal Welsh. The Rourke's Drift Company is again on operations and the leadership, teamwork and camaraderie that regimental spirit engenders are as real today for B Company in the fight against the Taliban as they were for their direct forebears at Rock's Drift. Rock's Drift has a huge significance to the men of B Company, a huge fact of pride for us that uh, we are the guys who carry on that legacy today and especially out here in Afghanistan now today. I think we have such a strong team spirit here and I think that comes from being from a Welsh regiment, coming from very close-knit small communities as we do where people have grown up playing rugby together, grown up working in the same mines and steelworks. Walk around the compound, going for a shave and all you can see is Welsh tattoos. I myself got three Welsh tattoos, Camry on my forearm, Maiden Wales are on my wrist, three feathers on my arm and uh, the regimental motto on my chest. I got a Welsh ring on, support the Royal Welsh, band, you know, it's, everybody's proud to be Welsh. Billy, one of the regiment's goats, is being prepared for the most important day in his calendar, St David's Day. At the moment I'm washing him down with lavender shampoo, so it just helps calm him down and get any stains off him. He's quite relaxed at the minute and hopefully tomorrow will be the same. He'll be able to uh, perform well, but obviously he'll have his off days. The regimental goat is a tradition that dates back to 1775. According to legend, a wild goat wandered onto the battlefield and led a victorious charge against the enemy. Goats have had honorary ranks in the regiment ever since. Billy's had this role since he was about three months old. He came here as a kid, really. He's now become a Lance Corporal, so he's getting on in the world, further in his career. So let's see how far he can get. At 6 a.m. on St. David's Day, the officers wake the soldiers in their beds with a gunfire breakfast. It's tea laced with rum, a tradition that goes back to World War I. Wakey, wakey, hands off, sneaky. Even brother. Oh, there he is. Oh, no. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Looking beautiful as ever. Cheers, sir. Thank you. Gunfire is a tradition that we do every St David's Day. It takes us back to the days in the uh, trenches when the soldiers were uh, given breakfast at gunfire. Uh, you had the, the rounds going over their heads every morning at first light, and uh, the officers would feed the soldiers, and they'd feed them and basically anything they could find, but mainly it was rum and tea. So uh, we try and keep the tradition and do it every time, every uh, St David's Day. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like it at all. It's not very nice to be woken up at six in the morning and have uh, have rum and tea shoved down your face. What time did you get in last night? About an hour ago. 
This St David's Day is particularly important to the Royal Welsh. It's the regiment's fifth birthday. On this day in 2006, the Royal Welsh was created after two regiments were amalgamated. The regiments celebrate with a fiercely competitive rugby tournament. Every year when you have uh, things like this, it keeps it keeps the spirits up with the boys. They've always got something to aim for, and it kind of keeps any sort of uh, solidarity and morale in the regiment up. Three cheers for Bravo! In the film Zulu, B Company is bound together and sustained by its Welsh spirit. The soldiers try to drown out the Zulu war chants by singing the Welsh hymn, Men of Harlech. Today, this is one of the Royal Welsh's regimental marches. But it wouldn't have had the same significance for the men at Rourke's Drift because only a third of them were Welsh. It was only in 1881, two years after Rourke's Drift, that the regiment began to recruit all its soldiers from Wales. This was the result of army reforms, which are the foundation of the regimental system today. The reforms effectively tied regiments to specific recruiting areas, uh, and they set up regimental depots uh, in each of those recruiting areas. Come on, let's go! All the soldiers are fiercely proud of being raw Welshmen and so uh, for us it, it really defines who we are and it's the most important character of the regiment. Beat it! Come on, Ryan. Come on, push it through! Come on, Ryan. Push it through! Three! Hooray! Chant! Three! By the right! Quick! March! Lance Corporal Billy is leading the officers to one of their greatest challenges of the year. In another regimental tradition, the officers and senior NCOs must serve lunch to their men on St David's Day. This is a more celebrated day on the calendar for us, the Royal Welsh. It's a very good day. As you can see, uh, the lads, they get a lot of stick all year round. And the dinner is their opportunity to give us a bit of stick. It's a change. We work hard for them all year, and now we're all the serious. <laughs> when you hear them banging on the tables, it's quite a little bit intimidating at first, but yeah, it's good fun. Good, good fun. Good to see them all kicking off. After the meal, Lance Corporal Billy makes his entrance. <laughs> Billy's arrival heralds another great Royal Welsh tradition, the league eating ceremony. The newest recruits are challenged to eat a raw leek and drink from what's known as the battalion's loving cup. In the officers' mess, the officers have their own leak-eating ceremony. 
Second Lieutenant Liam Maguire is taking part for the first time. I've heard rumours that they're going to lace it with a chilli and some other spicy things, so it should be quite fun. It's good to keep your sense of identity and know that you are from Wales and it's good to keep celebrating the things that make us different and when you know that you're on the front line and you, you've got people around you who are from the same place as you and they cherish the same type of things you do, it just brings you together and it helps that type of brotherhood out there which is really important. Anson David. B, Rourke's Drift Company, are about to return home from Afghanistan. But it's been a quiet journey so far, security on the route good. Has it been We've got there? eight or nine days left out of seven-month tour. I'm looking forward to getting back to Wales, all the guys here. Thankfully for us, thus far in the two months we've been here, we haven't had any instances of hijacking or IEDs on this route. So, so far, so good. It's been a good six months, seven months on this tour. The fighting spirit of Rourke's Drift and the regimental bond with Wales has made the Royal Welsh who they are today. We do rely on each other, you know. I'm confident that uh, if we were ever unfortunate enough to be put in a situation where we did have hordes and hordes of, uh, of enemy forces uh, running up the ramparts there, I think we, yeah, we could stick together and we could pull through and get through that. A week later, the families of the men in B. Rourke's Drift Company are gathering at the Wiltshire Barracks. This will be the first time they have seen the soldiers for six months. Every one of the 150 men who went out to Afghanistan have come home. Welsh are nuts, to be fair, they're all nuts. And I, I, don't, I couldn't see myself in, a, in another battalion having the same atmosphere and, you know, with each other. It's amazing to do our air cracking bunch of lads. As a Welshman, to serve uh, with the Royal Welsh in Afghanistan um, is a great thing. And uh, to obviously bring all my men back is one of the greatest feelings a man can have. I mean, just marching up there, I had tears in my eyes. So, you know, feelings, it's, it's, we're home, we're all home, we're all safe. Um, that's all that matters, really. <laughs> oh.